Good morning, everyone, and welcome to World Environmental Health Day 2014. It is Friday, September 26th, and today is the day that all across the globe we are addressing the issue of the inequality of access. Inequality of access to safe drinking water and to safe sanitation. And we have a six session seminar this morning and this afternoon. There will be a, a break at the lunch hour. If you need to download the schedule for the day, that's available from our website at wastewatereducation.org. If you want to uh, make a comment or ask a question, you can do so in the Google Plus event page for this session. And I'm going to lead off the day with a very, very brief uh, history of sanitation. And this is an enormous subject, so please forgive me if I skip over the bits that really you think are the most important, because um, we're talking here about a 2,000, 3,000 year plus history of uh, humanity's pursuit of safe drinking water and humanity's pursuit of removing our bodily waste. So we're going to be looking at the who, the what, the where, the when, a, a really quick explanation of uh, the main themes for the day. And I'm going to be the presenter, as I said, for the day. My name is Dendra Best. I'm the Executive Director of Wastewater Education. We are a national and international nonprofit organization based in beautiful northern Michigan, um, actually looking out over Lake Michigan, which always brings to mind the real need for uh, protection of drinking water. And again, just to remind you that I will be posting links and references to the Google Plus event page after, the, um, after this session. So don't be afraid of writing down URLs or uh, any information you see on here because we will be providing that after the event. And so the subject today really does talk about our dirty little secrets. Uh, the, the whole issue of human waste and our, our bodily functions is, is absolutely taboo in certain circles. We are not allowed to talk about it. Everybody does it. We know that. And we also know that we need to keep uh, what we do separate from where we drink our, our uh, water. And there seems to be the belief that at one time, all the water on Earth was pure. Well, let's be honest, there have always been microbes, pathogens, and parasites in all of the source waters of the globe. Um, we couldn't live without bacteria. That's actually what keeps us alive in many cases. But the issue is that the bacteria that are at work in our digestive system should stay there, and they should never come back and go into your mouth, into our uh, the top part of our digestive system. This is where we start to acquire some pretty nasty diseases. And it's interesting to think that uh, every age seems to believe that it's the most advanced, the most technologically superior. But um, I was reminded recently about uh, a story from the person who we're going to be drawing most of our resources from today, Mike McGuire. I'm going to be introducing him here in a couple of minutes. That on a recent trip to China, he had asked for a glass of drinking water and was quite surprised that when it came, it was warm. And his hosts uh, actually explained to him that this was the height of good manners, that from the very earliest of times, and particularly because they brewed tea extensively in China, that they realized um, that drinking plain water carried some risks to it. And so this is probably why uh, some of the Chinese laborers that were brought in to work on most of the big infrastructure projects in the latter part of the middle and the latter part of the 19th century uh, seem to become ill a lot less than the other people who were there. And it's mainly attributable to the fact that they were boiling their drinking water uh, to make tea. And to this day, in polite society in China, apparently, if you ask for a glass of water, when it comes, it will be warm to assure you that at some point it was actually boiled. 
And so today, I really do need to give a shout out to Michael McGuire. Mike writes two uh, blogs, two online history uh, publications. You'll see the addresses there. And again, I will be posting these after the event. And uh, most of the material today has come from his This Day in Water History .wordpress.com blog. Uh, Mike, as you see, is an is a eminent engineer. He's been active with the American Waterworks Association for many years. Um, he also is a member of the American Society of Civil Engineers and the International Water Association, and is currently the editor in chief for AWWA. And uh, thank you so much, Mike, for allowing me to cull the wonderful pages of this day in water history. And also his recent book, The Chlorine Revolution, where he really is looking at the incidences of linking safe sanitation with the equally important pursuit of safe drinking water. And so here we are in simpler times. Um, the image that we used for the publicity uh, PR piece for this. This is the ubiquitous backyard outhouse. And when we lived in rural settings, when <clears throat> people first settled the United States, uh, displacing the native population, of course, uh, they bought with them the basic hole in the ground. And we've been using the hole in the ground or the hole over the top of a water source ever since. And <laughs> The history of infrastructure and sanitation and drinking water infrastructure really comes about because we started to congregate in communities. And the result of that, the source of that rather, is that obviously we developed agriculture. The, the development of agriculture is the direct descendant of the, the development of civilization when we didn't have to grow our own food and we were dependent upon our own physical labor to feed ourselves, when we had a whole background of other people growing food and bringing it to a place where we could buy it ready harvested, made into bread, ready killed, uh, ready for us to take home, that's when we started to have homes where we congregate together. And any time, of course, that you congregate a bunch of people together, then you have not just one person defecating, but quite a few people defecating. So how to handle this huge amount of waste has been uh, on people's mind ever since we decided to have civilized settlements. And so much of the knowledge that was gained in ancient times of how to do this um, has been lost, and the real, the real champions of this were, of course, the Romans, who were amongst the most proficient of managing water and engineering water systems uh, from the very earliest of times. Uh, we need to remember that the Etruscans were the, the first civilization to settle what is now Rome, and most of what we know about ancient Rome is from a few hundred years after that. But what you're looking at here is the map of Rome, and the red line there is the famous Cloaca Maxima. The Romans actually had a goddess of the sewer systems because they appreciated very early on that uh, it was extremely unhealthy uh, to have people living in their own filth. And so the Cloacaea Maxima was one of the greatest sewer systems of its time. It was begun in about the year 600 BC by what was then the King of Rome, Tarquinus Priscus, a uh, wonderful name. And mostly this is, uh, was it when it began, there's some debate as to whether it was actually an open channel or whether some of it was already underground. but. It seems quite likely that some of it already was tunneled. And uh, it was pretty much uh, a, a system that was fed into from pipes from throughout the city. Uh, there is a wonderful series on the History Channel 
on and called Ancient Impossible. And there is, uh, sometimes it's still available for live feed, but it's also available for download of the incredible engineering system of pipes and, uh, and manifolds that directed both water and sanitation throughout the city. And here you have a picture of the modern day. Uh, actually, it's still there. And uh, the rule of thumb was that if you were one of the general population, you would take your uh, public your pot you know, out into the uh, the sewer and access, and you were supposed to empty it. There were certain rules and regulations of how to conduct yourself in ancient Rome. And of course, they also had a humongous system of public latrines, the first real public about the second century BC and these were quite public places they were places to go and socialize they were long bench seats with keyhole shaped offering openings and although you might think provided little privacy if you think about how you would traditionally think of Romans being dressed there was there was quite a lot of privacy as you hunched up your top uh, uh, undergarments. It was very difficult to be seen or doing your business. But on the other hand, um, these were uh, the latrines were free. Um, of course, some of the more upper scale ones, there were a small fee that was made on there. And uh, what you're looking at there are is a classic example of Roman infrastructure. Uh, underneath those rows of seats, there were gutters. And the gutters were routinely flushed by recycling waters from the famous Roman bath system. Um, the Romans were the first to seal those pipes that provided that in concrete. The Romans were masters of making concrete. Um, they used the volcanic ash from places like Vesuvius. Uh, again, the, the history of precast concrete really dates from Roman times. And you can remember we're talking here about pretty high pressure systems. Uh, Romans developed siphons, developed the manifold system. Um, but about that time, there was a real issue about um, piping. And you, what you're looking at there at the top right is a masterful invention, of course, of Roman times, which was lead piping. And lead is a byproduct of making silver. And again, the Romans were famous for their silver work. But it's estimated that at the peak production, about 80,000 metric tons of lead were being produced every year in the Roman Empire. And that's, that's pretty industrial scale operation. And it was used pretty extensively. And there's some debate about when we look at why the Roman Empire fell and why the, some of their emperors exhibited some very peculiar behavior. Uh, of course, today we know that lead is a poisonous substance and lead piping has, is still a, a, a bane of public health and environmental health all over the world. But here we are with lead piping in ancient Rome, which was pretty much made by hammering it out into sheets and folding it over, making it into a cylinder and extruding it into a piping. And lest you think what you're looking at there is the, the height of technology, uh, Roman piping could go down to as little as half an inch in diameter. And interestingly, of course, that um, lead piping has been viewed in the past as being absolutely the, the uh, preferred substance for piping in the United States. And one of the real heroes of sanitation is actually a lady, a lady who worked on um, and was the, the first, I believe, CEO of the American Pipe Company. So let's move on here. Um, as we've talked about the Romans, We started to gather together in two cities on our epic scale, on the same scale as Rome, but we seem to have forgot in the intervening 2,000 years how to actually do it safely. And uh, 
looking back over the history of sanitation, it's as much a history of science, biology, uh, um, biology as it is about building things. Top right there is a gentleman called Chester Avril, who you may not have heard about. And when we post the link to Mike McGuire's article about Chester Avril, bear in mind that we, we think about the advent of uh, realizing that waterborne disease was caused by virus and bacteria as being a much later, the middle to the late 19th century. And remember that Louis Pasteur, who was the, one of the champions of talking about microbiology, was pretty much vilified for most of the 19th century, even after he had proved his case. Well, Chester Avril was actually the professor of chemistry at the Union College in Schenectady, New York. And Avril is most famously known because he wrote a letter to the mayor of Schenectady uh, during the horrendous 1832 cholera epidemic. And he was encouraging the disinfecting properties of chloride of lime, i.e. chlorine. Um, most of the time, most of these times, the idea of disinfecting water to prevent contagion was, was pretty much thought is stupid. There was no such thing as viruses. And yet here we are in 1832 with the letter from Chester Avril to the mayor saying that um, the, it was really vital that they destruct certain viruses which are obviously responsible for the transmission of disease. And you can pretty much guess how that was received. And down below there is a picture of the infamous, the famous Broad Street pump. Cholera was the bane of its day. Um, cholera and typhoid and amoebic dysentery were, were the killers of people when they gathered together into large communities. If Chester was uh, far ahead of his time, then Snow was obviously uh, the hero of his day. London was plagued by wave after wave of cholera epidemic. This is where the famous punch cartoon depicting the king of cholera as being residing in the, the place of poverty is, is drawn from. In the 1850s, um, and actually they're back on the bicentenary of his birth, uh, together with Mike McGuire, we did create another day-long set of seminars about the impact of snow and the development of microbiology. And those YouTube videos are still available on our site. But he is most famous for being the father of epidemiology, that is tracking where the outbreaks occurred and where, the, where they've been drawing their water. And most famously, the Broad Street Public Wealth uh, was a hot spot. He, he could show that even people that didn't live there but came into that area to uh, get water, which of course, you know, we didn't have piped public water systems then, were getting sick. And he, of course, is most famous for encouraging the removal. There's some debate whether he actually took it off himself, but um, at his urging, the the pump was actually disabled by taking the handle right off it. And, you know, let's remember what most cities actually look like at this time. If you were crossing the street in New York City uh, from middle 19th century right up until the advent of public transportation by automobile and gas engine, this is probably what you would have seen. And one of the things I want us to talk about today in the rest of these sessions is that each civilization creates its own environmental nightmare. And each civilization will find a way to move on. And although we're going to be hearing about some pretty horrendous things today, we're also going to be hearing about some amazing opportunities to do things differently. And, you know, we need to remember that during the 19th century, the population in New York um, rose from about 39,000 a square mile uh, up to almost 91,000 people per square mile. We had waves upon waves 
of migration of people moving in. And to be honest, the reason that population keep growing was that more people moved in to live there than were dying in the tenements. And you can remember that the, the most uh, ubiquitous mode of transportation of that day was the horse. We talked today about the impact of the internal combustion engine. Well, everybody there who was anybody or had to deliver anything had a horse. And horses not only poop, but they eat as well. You know, the average horse in an urban setting, one and a half tons of oats or two and a half tons of A every year. And one of the big concerns in those times was how much land was not available for producing food for people because it was producing f food for animals. Um, it's estimated that about the size of the state of West Virginia in its time was needed to provide enough acreage to feed a horse. And, you know, let's remember at the height of the population, there were between 150,000 and 170,000 horses in New York City pulling cabs, pulling dry carts, uh, pulling carriages. And this meant, this is a staggering amount, between three and four million pounds of manure every day deposited on the city streets of New York. And uh, just to add icing on that, at least 40,000 gallons of urine. So, you know, it's not and never has been just human ways that we've had to deal with. So moving on here, let's, let's start back at the beginning almost. Here we are with the famous cesspits. Um, pretty soon it, was, it, was, it became pretty disgusting to have stuff running down channels in the street. And so the advent of the cesspit began, started in the 16th century, um, wasn't really regulated till the 18th century. The uh, tradesmen who were employed to clean out cesspits actually took their lives in their hands because there are numerous historical citations of people being overcome by the fumes within cesspits because, of course, what's in there ferments. And, uh, you know, it wasn't really until the mid 1800s that we start to see regulation about collecting and cleaning out cesspits. And what you're looking at here is a wonderful term. The term for the honey collector or the night soil men, uh, the people who went in with a horse and cart and the shovel to clean out these uh, outhouses and uh, uh, public privies, had numerous terms. And um, this is one of my favorite, as you can tell by my accent. I'm originally from the UK. The term the midnight mechanic is actually from Manchester in England. And it refers to the fact that because this stuff stunk to high heaven, that that's mostly why it was done at night. And hence the term the night soil man too. So um, I'm going to post a link into the chat window, into the, the, the event window afterwards. It's a wonderful video from the London, from the Thames uh, Sanitary Authority and the wastewater folks there. Because when this really came to attention, there were numerous examples of major cities having to deal with something pretty disgusting. And uh, here we are with the famous Punch cartoon again from 1855. And uh, it's become known as the big stink that the London sewer system like all major sewer systems then, and to some extent, some are still doing it today, their idea of dealing with human waste was to send it somewhere else, was to put it into a river or a receiving entity and to send it downstream. Well, all far the Thames moves pretty darn slowly at times. And of course, it's a tidal river. So when the tide goes out, what's on the surface tends to stay there and accumulate on the banks. And of course, in this particular time, um, the House of Parliament actually had to recess because the smell from that particular day on the Thames was so bad, it became known as the big stink. So 
here's another example of a tale of two cities. Here we have one of the major capitals in the world, London, having to deal with something that smells so foul they have to adjourn the Houses of Parliament. And above here and below are uh, what I would like to call the French connection. Uh, anybody who goes to Paris, do not give up the opportunity to go on a tour of the Paris sewer system. You still can. There's a wonderful museum in the sewers of Paris. Because pretty much from the time of Louis XIV right up through Napoleon I, Napoleon III, have been building sewers in Paris. Um, miles and miles of sewerage underneath the city. Most famously, of course, uh, celebrated as Jean Valjean going through the city sewers in Les Miserables. But up above, you will see the how the city of Paris is laid out. And down below, you will see the city of Washington, which I'm not sure many people actually know that Washington was laid out by a French architect. And you will see there the Pierre L'Enfant began the project, was finished by Andrew Ellicott. And an amazing system, too, of sanitary sanitation, sanitary sewer systems. But the difference in Paris was that they built a dual system, one to supply water, drinking water, and one for the sewers. Um, this was not the case in Washington with inevitable results. So here we are with uh, child William Wallace Lincoln. Uh, he may have been, I'm not in touch, I could say was, but was certainly one of the first children to die in the White House from typhoid. Because the drinking water for the White House in 1860 was carried into there and most probably came from the Potomac River. And, and Looking at the date here, you will realize there were thousands of soldiers and horses camped on the bank of the Potomac River. And most likely that was the source of the typhoid that carried off poor little Willie Wallace Lincoln. And the Civil War really is the time that we start to see the rise of the term sanitarian. The sanitarians, their main job was to keep soldiers healthy. Anytime you gather a large amount of people together in one location, as we've seen, in this particular case, soldiers and their, their horses, um, you need to have people who know how to keep the stuff away from the water. And there are many heroes in the sanitarian profession. Um, not enough time here to list them all. Here we have George Warren Fuller, who I think Mike quite quite rightly describes as probably one of the most innovative and most celebrated sanitary engineers of his time. We must not forget Leo, John Leo. We must not forget, obviously, Dr. Snow as well. Um, and all the other people who really their life's work was to make it obvious that um, we needed to pay as much attention to drinking water quality as we did to sanitary uh, systems. And Mike, back in 2012, gave a talk along with one of his colleagues about the comparison of George Warren Fuller and Dr. John Snow. And they actually did it in costume. So again, after the event, I'm going to post the three links. It's divided into three uh, separate sessions, but it describes Fuller's life and actually the first use of chlorine and the Jersey City water supply. And that was in 1908. And I put the title here, Welcome to Their World, because even though we knew what was in drinking water. We still had something called the common cup. Uh, this was, it was a common practice. People didn't have their travel mugs. They didn't have piped water. Water still came from a public supply. And most often, as you see there, there was a cup on a chain where you know, you've got running water there, but consider how many people's lips those cups reached. Um, Actually, it was it was an unimaginable issue. Um, if, 
there's an interesting comment here that I wanted to read in fall. Uh, you know, in 12, we knew what caused diseases. It was pretty obvious that uh, disease was transmitted in water. Uh, let's uh, read this because after the banning of the Common Cup, because in uh, 2012 we celebrated actually the, the centenary of the banning of the Common Cup which was uh, banned, as, as we say, in 2012. But um, let's read this. One of the representatives of this board, being the New Jersey State Health Board, while traveling on a railroad train, noted that a family of children was afflicted with whooping cough. And as the children had spasmodic attacks, after each attack had passed, they would go to the water cooler and take a drink from the glass, the glass which was then common. After this had been repeated several times, the inspector uh, took occasion to go to the cooler, holding the glass up to the light, found that it was smeared with the infected mucus from all of those children with whooping cough. And it's interesting to note that following that, there was actually an editorial in the Railway Local magazine, which lamented what it said was, um, those cranks whose senseless agitation has eliminated the public drinking cup, even in our Pullman cars. This has inflicted much discomfort upon ordinary people and has largely increased the business of saloon keepers. So apparently it was, it was uh, pretty, pretty uh, common to drive people to drinking houses, but uh, protecting them from whooping cough was something different. So now we come to the period where this phrase really enters the history of sanitation. Dilution is the solution. And even today, when you are planning a municipal sewer system, there is what's called the dilution factor. And the idea being that there, if there is a sufficient body of water to take your human and industrial and animal waste, it will dilute it down to a level where it was safe. This, of course, is the famous Union Stockyards built in 1864. They actually drained swampland on the south of the Chicago area to build this. Um, it was built, again, in conjunction with the railway company. And here we are again making this link between uh, advances in transportation, advances in food preparation, with the creation of an unforeseen consequence, which in this case, of course, is the famous Union stockyards. And if you want an idea of what this would have looked like, even though this, this picture here is from 1947, if you've been standing there at the height of the end of the eight of the 19th century, this is what you would have seen. Um, it had 2,300 separate livestock pens. It was supposed to be able to accommodate at least 75,000 pigs, 21,000 cattle, 22,000 sheep at any one time. And around the stockyards, this was obviously a hub for commerce, so a whole network of hotels, saloons, restaurants, all that thing, type of urban development grew up around this. Um, it was an amazing, it, the smell and the flies and the dust um, must have been pretty horrendous. And remember that many of these animals were butchered on site. And approximately it's between 1865 and 1900, probably around 400 million animals were actually butchered on site at the stockyards. And so what was their solution? That was to build the Chicago Sanitary Canal. This was the, uh, and still is, an, uh, a piece of infrastructure that has caused no end of issues and problems for the years that have gone by. The famous Chicago Sanitary Canal was uh, a diversion and uh, it was, it was built upon a huge public relation event too. There was a big storm that washed most of the stuff out of Chicago out into Lake Michigan. And in fact, there was a rumor begun that a huge epidemic that killed thousands of people had occurred. And 
all the evidence is that this was totally false. It never happened. If it did happen, it happened downstream from Chicago, uh, where the stuff was uh, diverted to. So after the opening of the Chicago Canal, uh, obviously the people who were downstream from this were not happy. Uh, anyone that lived downstream on the Mississippi and Missouri uh, was pretty shocked to wake up and find this coming down. And uh, again, I'm going to post the link to this map of how the river flowed in before the diversion and afterwards. Because if you look at any of the uh, satellite images, the Chicago River and is one of the only rivers in the world where the inflow is blue. Uh, most rivers have deltas. You will see uh, effluent and sediment coming out of it. But obviously, in this particular case, that isn't happening. It's going downstream. So what was life like in the cities of the 19th century, end of the 19th century? Um, it was pretty uncommon to see it. People did not use the new advent of photography to take pictures of the poor until along came this uh, wonderful pioneering photojournalist, Jacob Rees. And this is one of his many famous pictures that he took in the 1890s. Um, he is most famous for writing a book that we, a phrase we still use today. It was called How the Other Half Lives. And not only was Reese famous for taking pictures outside, and you can see the common gutter there. Uh, there are no sewers here. What you see there running down the street is what you wouldn't want to see today running down the street anywhere. What Rees captured was possible because of the invention of flash photography. You can only imagine what these poor folks felt like as the huge flash bulb went off and illuminated this room. But the pictures were startling. Um, this really made people aware of the squalor and the conditions that people were living in. And you know what was the reaction to this? Well, it was start building. And Victorians and Edwardians built on massive scale, particularly in the US and in Europe. Uh, they built palaces, palaces to water treatment, palaces of pump houses. Huge amounts of raw materials were available, a huge supply of cheap labor, and we started to build. And pretty much we've been building ever since. Uh, here we started to realize that the only way to sewer this particular area was again same thing to pipe it out to sea. You will see there that it, it carried the uh, effluent from northern New Jersey and it went out into New York Bay. And <clears throat> it's interesting to do a comparison of the cost because we look here that this cost 12 million dollars in 1915 and a really quick uh, look at conversion of that in today's dollars it's about 287 million and again here we are in 1916 with the advent of what is today almost the standard for treating wastewater the activated sludge process this is one of the first two eventually of course Chicago had to build a wastewater treatment plant because even they realized they couldn't be sending everything downstream so here we have the first activated sludge plant it's in Cleveland but you will notice too the all wastewater treatment plants still have to be built on the banks of a receiving water source a lake a stream a river the ocean and the inevitable results and Mike McGuire in one of his uh, articles that I'll post the link to show that even the massive expansion of sewerage systems did not result in a matching reduction of uh, waterborne disease, particularly cholera and typhoid, um, mostly typhoid after 1911. It's widely believed that the last incidence of cholera in the United States was a about 1911 in any great numbers, although we still have sporadic outbreaks even today. The, I think the saddest thing is that Wilbur Wright died from typhoid fever. He was only 45 years old 
and although we knew about chlorination of drinking water at this time, um, it was still uh, not particularly well instituted. We were still, here is the height of its day. This is the Santa Monica Pier. Today, of course, it's known as a place of recreation, but when it was built, it was built to carry the sewer outflow pipe. It went out 1,600 feet into the Pacific Ocean. So this, this is still, was then, the, the height of how to treat wastewater. And again, we have to remember that it isn't just human waste that we have to take into account when we do sanitation. This is the mouth of the Fox River. Uh, in Wisconsin and we are still seeing issues with this. It's still one of the areas of concern. Uh, it, it's unacceptable now as it was then to use a public waterway as a place to discharge industrial and chemical waste and unfortunately this still happens. So, and I think when I put this slide in, it was to say that what is old is new and what's new is old. Even though we knew about outdoor privies um, and we knew that when you accumulate a large number of people in one place, in this case for World War One, for the mobilization of troops when America entered World War World War One. Um, that we needed to sanitate not just where they congregated, but all the homes around there. And again, this is a shout out to the pre-gas concrete industry because the invention of the concrete septic tank in its day, and even today, is one of the most useful methods of controlling human waste. But what changed? Uh, we've got to this point and we don't seem to be making any progress. So what happened? Well, you know, the regulations that we have stem from the seminal year 1969. And it is the year when we have startling contrasts. This is when we had the technology to send a man to the moon. We had the technology to film and broadcast live our first footsteps going out onto a different surface other than this planet. And yet in the same year, this was the famous fire on the Cuyahoga River. And the interesting thing about this, even though it awakened the, the ire of the nation and resulted <clears throat> ultimately in the burning river becoming the symbol that started the passage of the Clean Water Act. At its time, it was so common that the local paper never even sent a photographer down to, to cover it. There had been upwards of 13 fires on the Cuyahoga River. It had been described as, as a, a river that oozes rather than, fl than flows. Um, it really was an open sewer. But when the fire that spurred the actual nation to action took place in 1969, it only caused about $50,000 in damage. Whereas uh, the, the one from before that in 1952 had caused over a million in damage. But in 1952, I don't think there was the media exposure that uh, accompanied that event. And of course, we need to remember that <clears throat> more than human waste is now disposed of in the sewer system and in uh, backyard septic systems and on-site septic systems. We've come accustomed to flush and forget. Everything that we have, we believe, we can safely flush down the toilet now or flush down the sewer. Um, there was a, a webinar just this week uh, from EPA and about the incidence of pharmaceuticals, pharmaceutical and pesticide and personal care products in both the effluent and in the biosolids. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> All of our products now contain fire retardants. <clears throat> contain surfactants, contain thousands, or upwards of 80,000 products that contain uh, chemical compounds. And uh, what does this mean? We, we're not just using activated sludge products to 
take care of human waste anymore. Humans are a vector for an amazing amount. The bottom image there, of course, includes a gentleman using face shaving cream that probably contains microbeads, which are the, the emerging contaminant of concern. And so a wake-up call happened. And what is the wake-up call? Uh, anybody, if you've watched the trailer from the beginning of this session, <clears throat> it is, <clears throat> excuse me, it is that we are still seeing thousands of cases of waterborne disease. And the bugs are winning. I, I'm not going to be alarmist about this, but everyone who operates a drinking water intake now is constantly on the guard for, as our climate changes, as our water sources change, that, as the gentleman in the video said, there is always a new bug on the horizon. At the time of the big cryptosporidia outbreak in Milwaukee, it was not on their radar at all. Uh, cryptosporidia is actually resistant to chlorine. And it was mistaken at the time for a bacterial infection, whereas cryptosporidia, of course, is a parasite. And you can look there, and we will post links afterwards to resource information about the great Milwaukee outbreak. because. I cannot imagine, and I'm, I'm pretty much sure that most people will agree that their idea of hell is being stuck on a cruise ship with an outbreak of foodborne and waterborne disease. So what is the, the, the emphasis for the rest of the day? We've, we've done here a really quick overview of how we got to this point. And where we're at at this point is um, something that WEF, Water Environment Federation, and numerous other water agencies are trying to focus the attention on. Is that over the course of the last 100, 150 years, we've created a huge infrastructure. Um, but we haven't supported that with enough ongoing funding to keep it in good repair. And you will look there that there is an estimate from the Government Accounting Office of between 485 to 1.2 trillion dollars, 485 billion to 1.2 trillion dollars, just to keep what's in the ground running. And although we've made considerable strides with the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Clean Water Drinking Act, um, we are continually seeing attacks upon those major keystone pieces of legislation. And old enemies most certainly do return. Anybody that thinks we beat cholera um, was not in Haiti after the horrendous earthquake. And later on this afternoon, we're going to be talking about Haiti and how, how do we deal with a country that has suddenly been plunged back uh, over 100 years to a time when, of course, cholera was, was, was eradicated, but has been reintroduced by a circumstance of environment and climate and tragic circumstances. And I thought I'd put this one in for a bit of light relief. Um, we really, we tell so many toilet jokes. We have so many urban legends about uh, the underground, the, the sewer system and what it can and can't do. Uh, Tom Ottenes is a, a, does amazing public sculpture pieces and gave permission for us to use this one. But the the real point of this is that the, yes, there are there are real monsters still at work and still present in our in our sanitation and drinking water system. And obviously, we're not controlling surface water issues. And no, this this probably wouldn't be an issue, except that we're pulling our drinking water source from the same place that we are contaminating with with groundwater contamination and also with runoff. And that picture there on the left is from August of this year, one of the most massive algae blooms of Lake Erie has seen in many years. Picture on the right is from Ohio, Sandusky, Ohio in 2006. And remember that this was the year that uh, Toledo and most of that area was prevented from having its drinking water source uh, usable because of toxic algae. Um, have we learned nothing, I guess? And this image is one of the amazing NASA 
space images that, uh, are, and again, I will post the link for this in the resource. And it is to remind us how fragile our existence is on this planet. Uh, that tiny blue dot is where we are. Everything that you see around you, every breath you take, every person you will see today is dependent upon one thing, and that is water. We're, we have nowhere else to go. This is the only planet we will have, at least in our foreseeable future, maybe in the future. But that is the blue that keeps us alive. And what do we do with it? Well, this is what we do with it. Um, it's incredibly sad that in, there are many places in this world, which brings us back to the point of today, World Environmental Health Day, where the inequality of access to safe water and to safe drinking water is so painfully obvious. And uh, one of our speakers, who's coming up next in about 10 minutes, will be talking about uh, options, options for people other than um, going down the same path that we've talked about so far. And he pointed out to me an, a, a thing in this picture that really goes to the heart of humanity having the ability to find its own way. Um, as we've said, each age will find its its own best technology, its own best engineering. But equally, and one of the things we'll be talking about this afternoon is that each community, each culture has its own best path to get there. And that even in this squalor, even in the God only knows what's in that water, look at all those pressed and clean and hung clothes. Uh, don't assume as was equally evident in the 19th century, that poor people are stupid and that poor people who are living in poverty are there because it's their own fault or that they lack the mental and, and uh, moral ability to find their own solutions. Because even in this image here, everyone there will go out that day and send their kids off to school in perfectly clean and compressed clothing. And that gives us hope and leads us in nicely to the next session. And we're going to be closing this session down. I will be uh, welcoming you back into session two. Uh, we will see you a little around 11 o'clock for session two when you will get to meet Patrick Lucy. Thank you all for attending and we will see you all for session two in about 10 minutes. Good morning.